Okay, so welcome everybody. Good afternoon uh, and welcome to the virtual launch event of the first Don't Buy Into Occupation uh, report. So my name is William Stas. I'm the, the coordinator of the coalition. Uh, so we'll say a few words um, about the coalition and then pass the floor to my colleague uh, Ines, who will moderate the whole session. Um, so just to uh, uh, to start with um, a few words on the coalition, uh, we are a cooperation uh, between 26 uh, organizations, uh, so regional and national human rights, solidarity organizations and movements uh, in Palestine, Belgium, France, Netherlands, Ireland, uh, Norway and Spain. Uh, so we were established in late 2020, um, and basically we want to investigate and highlight the financial relationships uh, between, on the one hand, um, yeah, companies in Israeli settlements, uh, and on the other hand, European financial institutions. Uh, and so in order to do so, we, we aim to publish an annually updated research report, uh, which will then serve as the basis for joint advocacy and campaigning across the continent. And so, yeah, as you know, uh, today uh, we have launched our uh, first such report, uh, hopefully the first uh, out of many. Um, and so to kick off the, yeah, the, the launch and publication of this report, uh, we have uh, assemb assembled a star team of speakers. Um, and yeah, so I'll uh, pass the floor to, to Ines to say a few words about the speakers uh, and then uh, yeah, we'll um, get uh, started. Ines, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, William. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you today uh, to launch this, uh, this coalition project campaign initiative, important. And I'm, I'm really happy to have such a, an amazing panel with us today. So we are joined today uh, by uh, Maha Abdallah, uh, by Omar Shakir, by Naim Abed Mohammed Shukair, and by Professor Michael Link, who I will present as, as they are uh, speaking. So just a, a couple of housekeeping issues. Uh, you are uh, in a webinar, so um, you can ask uh, questions in the Q&A, written questions. Uh, please uh, avoid long and uh, lengthy comments in the Q&A uh, and, and, and uh, privilege uh, short and concrete questions. Uh, if you like a question and you would like to ask a similar question, you can also like and vote for a, a question that has been asked um, already in the Q&A and we'll uh, answer them in the Q&A session. So we'll have one hour discussion with our panelists and then 30 minutes for exchanging and and answering your, your questions. Um, for those who would like interpretation, uh, please, there is interpretation channels. Uh, so uh, English and Chinese, it's not Chinese, it's Arabic. Uh, unfortunately, Zoom doesn't uh, offer Arabic yet. Um, and so it's, uh, if you want to hear the Arabic, uh, please press Chinese. فللترجمه للعربيه في channel اسمه chinese uh, على اليمين تحت uh, so you can you can hear uh, the translation and same for english you can press the, the english channel to stay on the english or have english translation when uh, a panelist is speaking in arabic so um, without further ado i will uh, we will start uh, the conversation um, and uh, I will ask first uh, Maha Abdallah. Uh, Maha Abdallah is the International Advocacy Officer for the Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies, uh, one of our uh, active partners in the coalition. And Maha has been, uh, you know, is one of the co-author of the report. Uh, so hello, Maha. Uh, and um, yeah, Maha, so can you tell us a bit uh, what are the main findings of, of this report, of the Don't Buy Into Occupation report, uh, you know, the main recommendations and, and what does it offer to uh, the, the different groups we are, uh, you know, uh, targeting and, and um, trying to recommend uh, to, including financial institutions, companies, European governments and, and local authorities.
Thank you, Ines. I'm just trying to uh, share my screen with everybody. Um, can you see the PowerPoint presentation now? Yes. Okay, Go perfect. Ahead. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, Ines, and thank you, Willem, also for the introduction. In uh, the next 15 minutes, I will share with you uh, the main finding of today's report as well as the responsibilities of private actors, including financial institutions and business enterprises, and the obligations of states within this context, as outlined in the report that we're launching today. I will also share with you some of the main uh, recommendations. But uh, before I go uh, into that, I would like to uh, first briefly highlight the methodology that was used in the research and writing process of this report. And to start with, uh, with the geographic scope of the research, which, which is concerned with exposing the financial flows from Europe into Israeli settlements, focused uh, on the occupied West Bank, including the eastern part of Jerusalem. And uh, in choosing uh, this uh, specific geographic scope uh, or focus, the coalition does not by any means intend to reinforce the long imposed fragmentation of the Palestinian people. And that is a point that is made very well and cl clear throughout the report. From the other side of the spectrum, the geographic focus of the research into financial institutions focused on those that are based in the 27 European uh, Union member states, also in Norway and the United Kingdom. Um, and second, for the selection of the business enterprises uh, that are involved in the settlement enterprise, and therefore included in this report, we relied on the list of uh, activities that was used in the UN database of businesses involved in Israeli settlements. And this database, it was established by the UN Human Rights Council and published in February 2020 by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. So these business enterprises were then screened for financial relationships with European financial institutions between January 2018 and May 2021. Naturally, of course, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, as well as international law, were key in the assessment and inclusion criteria of these businesses. And here I should remind that under international law, Israeli settlements, their maintenance and expansion are illegal and comprise a number of violations and acts that amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. This is reflected in the report's legal analysis, which is also in concert with the cumulative recognition of Israel's apartheid and persecution of Palestinians, evidenced in their segregation and fragmentation and in Israel's discriminatory laws, policies, and practices embodied in the settlement enterprise. It is also important to uh, note that the companies identified have a wide range of activities. Therefore, the identified financial flows between these companies and the financial institutions that we exposed in this report are not necessarily exclusively linked to the settlements, but they cover their overall and broader business activities. And the last point about methodology that I would like to raise is that the financial institutions mentioned in the main body of the report were given the opportunity to review and to respond to the results of the report. The coalition contacted 138 financial institutions in this process. Also, the business enterprises that were uh, highlighted or showcased in the two case studies and the companies that are not on the UN database that were listed in this report were also contacted and given the opportunity to respond and comment. To date, we have received the responses from 22 financial institutions and six companies. Now I would like to move to the main findings of the report. And the report before you today found that between January 2018 and May 2021, there were 672 European financial institutions, including banks, asset managers, insurance companies, and pension funds that had financial relationships with 50 business enterprises that are actively involved with Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank, including the eastern part of Jerusalem. During this period, 
114 billion US dollars was provided in the form of loans and underwritings to the 50 businesses identified. In the slide in front of you, you can see the top 10 of these. Meanwhile, as of May 2021, European investors held 141 billion US dollars in shares and bonds of these 50 businesses. Again, in, the next, in this slide in front of you, you can see the top uh, 10 of these. Once again, it's important to remind that these 50 companies that were identified are involved in one or more of the listed activities that were mentioned earlier. The report also uh, presents three main case studies covering two business enterprises and one bank. The first case study was uh, of BNP Paribas, which is domiciled in France and is Europe's uh, large ba largest bank by assets. And the bank was identified to have been uh, the biggest European creditor to 27 businesses involved with Israeli settlements at a total worth of about 17 billion US dollars. It is also the 12th largest uh, European investor of shares and bonds in businesses identified in this report to be involved with the Israeli settlements. The second case study was of Booking.com, which is a brand, a brand of Booking Holdings, the United States, and is incorporated in the Netherlands and was listed in the 2020 UN database for its marketing and enabling of listing of accommodation in illegal settlements. The company essentially profits from listing property and homes that were unlawfully appropriated, seized and expropriated from Palestinians in occupied territory. And the report found that Deutsche Bank, BNP Paribas, HSBC, Standard Chartered provided 590 million US dollars in loans and 1.6 billion US dollars in underwriting services to booking holdings between January 2018 and May 2021. It also found that the four largest investors in booking holdings are BPCE Group, Janice Henderson, Credit Agricole, and Government uh, Pension Fund Global in uh, Norway. Then we have the third uh, case study that was uh, included in the report, which is that of Heidelberg Cement. And uh, Heidelberg Cement is headquartered in Germany and through its subsidiary Hansen Israel has been unlawfully exploiting the Palestinian stone reserve and resources for nearly 14 years, particularly in the Nahal Rabah quarry located on Palestinian land in the village of Al Zawiya. The exploitation amounts to the crime of pillage and the destruction of resources and other serious violations. And in this uh, report, it was found that uh, Deutsche Bank, Danske, Danske Bank, BNP Paribas, and Credit Agricole are some of the key creditors to Heidelberg Cement in Europe, providing about 8.4 uh, billion US dollars worth of loans and underwriting services. Deutsche Bank, Deka Group, and Credit Agricole are also among Heidelberg Cement's, Heidelberg Cement's three largest investors in Europe. So in addition to being involved in a myriad of uh, human rights violations and grave violations against Palestinians through the settlement enterprise, another common factor between uh, these three case studies is that despite their claims, they have also failed to align themselves with international standards and human rights with the UN guiding principles and the OECD guidelines, despite their claims. In reality though, and as we have uh, unfolded in this report, these three and many other financial institutions and business enterprises, they continue to pump billions into an enterprise that constitutes inter internationally recognized crimes and that feeds off the dispossession and oppression of the Palestinian people. Businesses and financial institutions bear a responsibility under international law, both human rights and humanitarian law. Those that are directly or indirectly involved in an illegal situation, such as that created by the settlement enterprise, whether by financing, insuring, trading, supplying, or others, they run a high risk of being involved in grave violations, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, 
including by facilitating and or contributing to them. As such, and as outlined in the recommendations of this report to financial institutions and business enterprises, they must conduct enhanced human rights due diligence to prevent and mitigate those. Businesses should immediately also and responsibly disengage from such an illegal enterprise and seize their activities and relationships in such contexts. Banks and pension funds that are providing the large sums of money for these businesses should also use their leverage and ensure that the companies they invest in are acting responsibly in line with international law. When they are not, the banks and pension funds should immediately and responsibly divest from these businesses. Businesses and financial institutions cannot continue to follow the lead of the occupying power in legitimizing the pillage and the destruction of Palestinian resources, in exploiting Palestinian wealth and labor force, in imposing a captive market on Palestinians while subjugating and coercing them into economic dependency and de-development for the ultimate purpose of asserting colonial domination. Very recently, there were two uh, very positive examples of KLP and the Norwegian government pension fund Global, who took up their responsibility to divest from business enterprises within their portfolios uh, and that are linked with Israeli settlements. The two, between the two, they have excluded 19 companies and banks that are involved in the settlement enterprise. And the representative from KLP will, will likely speak to us more about the reasons and criteria that were used in this exclusion. And uh, moving forward uh, to uh, also um, uh, to, to, uh, moving forward, it's, it's important to also note that the report uh, also emphasized that states remain the primary duty bearers under international law and should accordingly act upon their obligations in this context. Namely, um, to ensure respect for international humanitarian law, not to recognize as legal the internationally wrongful acts of another state, like the settlement enterprise, not to render aid or assistance in maintaining an illegal situation, and to cooperate to bring such breaches to an end. In addition, and within the framework of the UN guiding principles, states must protect against human rights violations by third parties, including business enterprises within their territory and jurisdiction. And this requires states to take concrete action to prevent, investigate, punish, and redress corporate related abuses that fall within their jurisdiction, including through effective policies, legislations, binding regulations, and litigation. It's important to note as well that the UN guiding principles are very clear that in conflict affected situations and where a business enterprise is involved in gross violations and does not, to, does not take action or cooperate to address it, the state should deny the business from accessing public support and services. Therefore, and besides the recommendations uh, directed and companies, at companies and financial institutions, the report also lays out 16 recommendations for European governments, institutions, and local authorities. The report calls on European governments to prohibit the import of illegal settlement products and services into European markets and ban trade with and economic support for illegal settlements as part of relevant positive and customary obligations of third states under international humanitarian law. The report also calls on these governments and institutions to provide political and financial support to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to fulfill its mandate in its entirety and to annually update and publish the UN database of business enterprises involved in settlements. The coalition also calls on governments to publish updated business advisories on direct and indirect financial investments, activities, and relationships with the Israeli settlement enterprise and warn about the legal risks and consequences that come with these. 
Another recommendation that the report highlights for governments and European uh, government institutions is to apply public uh, procurement laws that are in line with international law and which entail avoiding the awarding of public contracts to companies involved in grave violations of international law. And another important recommendation that the report, uh, that the report delivers is the call on European governments and on the European Union to adopt stronger and binding regulations at national, regional, and international levels to ensure corporate respect for international law and human rights, as well as redress and access to justice for victims. The upcoming legislative proposal by the European Commission on Environmental and Human Rights Due Diligence serves as a key opportunity also to address corporate involvement in violations and crimes in situations of, of conflict and occupation, such as that in Palestine. This is also key to include in the European national initiatives in this regard. In the same vein, European governments and the EU should play a constructive role in the negotiations surrounding the UN binding treaty and ensure that such issues are positively addressed and included in the final text. I will stop here for now. Thank you so much for listening. You can read the full list of recommendations and the report uh, that are available online at this link. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maha. And I hope that the, the decision makers and policymakers listening to us are taking good notes of all, all the recommendations you're, you're putting out and indeed, uh, the, uh, I think the link was put in the chat uh, for our website uh, where you can find the full report, but also executive summary in uh, seven languages and, uh, and also the, the graphics that uh, Maha presented to you. We'll also put her presentation there. And, um, and if you have colleagues or people you know have missed this event, uh, we will also put the recording on the website. Uh, I'll pass the, the floor now to, to Omar, Omar Shaker. Uh, you are the Israel-Palestine uh, Director for Human Rights Watch. Uh, you're currently based in Jordan, given that you were uh, deported uh, by Israel for your activities. Um, so Omar, uh, thanks for, for being with us today. So I was going to ask you about kind of the international you know, norms and standards that, that business uh, enterprises and financial institutions uh, should follow, but Maha already, you know, exposed some of those, including the UN guiding principles and the, the OECD guidelines. So just from your perspective, you know, what specific actions does Human Rights Watch, like an international NGO like Human Rights Watch, expect from businesses and financial institutions operating in Israeli settlements? And maybe you can also tell us, does it relate and how it relates to, to your recent uh, you know, uh, report and findings of uh, the situation of apartheid uh, between the, the Mediterranean uh, Sea and the, and the Jordan River. Uh, the floor thank is yours. You. Thank you, Ines, so much for that. And let me just take the opportunity to really thank the coalition for this really thorough, incredible report, which I know will be a rich resource for us at Human Rights Watch, and I hope uh, to all of the, you on the call, you take the time to go through it. It's a long report, but there's a lot of really important work that's been done there. And uh, and as, as you said, I think uh, Maha really did a, a, a thorough job of laying out the standards. Let me sort of start from there and sort of link to Human Rights Watch's position on these issues based on our three decades of work in Israel and Palestine, looking at the role of uh, all actors, including businesses and their contributions to human rights. Um, you know, as Maha put it, under the UN guiding principles, businesses are expected to conduct due diligence that's aimed to assess their own direct contribution to human rights abuses, as well as their indirect contributions, their contributions through their business relationships. And the idea here is that businesses should assess those activities they should mitigate the impact of their activities. And where it's not possible to do so, of course, they should end you know, those uh, activities. Um, at Human Rights Watch, we have an entire division dedicated to business and human rights, which applies that model. And let me be clear, the UN guiding principles are a baseline. They're not meant to be a ceiling, but a floor. So we would hope that businesses go beyond. But what we do is we study business activities and we issue recommendations 
aim towards ensuring that they comply with their human rights responsibilities. Now, generally, we look at activities individually. We'll look at a specific business or industry and we'll make an assessment about their activities and issue recommendations on that basis. When it comes to activities and settlements, our years of work led us to the inescapable conclusion that the abuses are so deep and are so pervasive that when businesses operate in settlements, it's not possible to avoid or mitigate contribution to severe human rights abuse. How did we reach that conclusion? We released a report in 2016 called Occupation Inc. And it found, and it's a long report as well that I encourage folks to read, that businesses that operate in settlements in four different ways both contribute and benefit from serious abuses of human rights. Let me lay those out briefly. The first is that businesses are benefiting from land confiscated, stolen from Palestinians through a wide variety of different mechanisms, which I don't have time here to go through. But the bottom line is if you're operating in, in a settlement, no matter what, you're operating on land that has been confiscated, that's been stolen from Palestinians. In some case, land that even the Israeli government acknowledges is privately owned by Palestinians. Uh, of course, Palestinians can't enter those settlements except as laborers bearing special permits. Secondly, when you're operating in a settlement, you're benefiting from resources, infrastructure, services that are systematically denied to Palestinians. Of course, Palestinians uh, in the area under exclusive Israeli control, which is where settlements exist, Area C, it's effectively impossible for them to get a building permit. Between 2016 and 2018, according to government data, the government issued 100 times more demolition orders than building permits for Palestinians in Area C. So when you're operating in a settlement, you're getting resources, you're using roads, you're getting permits, you're getting water, electricity, all of which is being systematically denied to Palestinians. So you are benefiting from a two-tiered system that operates there. Thirdly, when you're operating in a settlement, you're contributing to entrenching and sustaining settlements, right? Beyond the human rights abuse, of course, settlements violate the Fourth Geneva Convention, as was mentioned. This is a, you know, con a serious violation of international humanitarian law. When you operate in a settlement, you are paying, uh, you know, taxes, you're paying royalties to the local settlement municipality. You are, in many cases, hiring settlers that are operating there. So you're in, in helping to entrench and sustain. And many of the businesses and settlements provide services to it, right? Infrastructure, uh, you know, waste disposal. So you're actually further uh, entrenching that. And fourth and finally, when you're operating in a settlement, you are contributing to serious abuses of the rights of Palestinian laborers. One of the arguments that's often raised against um, you know, the, this sort of recommendation is, well, Palestinians are being employed. But the reality is a Palestinian who works in a settlement is doing so because the Israeli occupation has left them with no other economic source. They've you know, stolen the resources. They've developed the economy such that they're dependent and need to go to a settlement to work. And in that settlement, there are laws that govern them when it comes to minimum wage, labor conditions, are different than the laws that would apply to a Jewish Israeli settler working in the same plant. And there has been a body of significant research, again, I don't have time to go into it, about the serious rights abuses that Palestinians face who work in settlements, including children, uh, including many, many others. So just taking a step back, because of these different ways in which businesses contribute to human rights abuse. There is no way to mitigate that. You can't mitigate operating on stolen land. You can't mitigate and get, you know, getting permits denied to Palestinians and roads and infrastructure. You can't mitigate paying local um, taxes and providing services to settlements, nor being part of that two-tiered labor system. On that basis, Human Rights Watch's position is that businesses should cease operating in settlements in order to comply with their human rights responsibilities. We actually go a step further. We also say, of course, that you know, investors need to do their, their due diligence and ensure right, that they are adhering to their own obligations and making sure that they're not investing in settlement-related uh, businesses, because invariably that makes them um, linked, complicit in the underlying 
you know, human rights abuse. Let me just sort of answer the last part of your question, Ines, uh, before I turn it back to you, which is about apartheid. Human Rights Watch released a major report in April um, finding that Israeli authorities are committing the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. We are not the first people to reach these conclusions. You can find reports by Palestinian human rights organizations, including the Cairo, you know, and plus groups like the Cairo Institute. You can find ones by Israeli groups and others. Um, but this was quite significant because we reached the determination that crimes against humanity are taking place. Crimes against humanity are the most odious, you know, under international law, right? And there is an obligation upon all of us to ensure that these abuses don't take place. Again, I don't have time to get into how we reach this finding in the report. I'm happy to in the Q in, in the Q and A, but it was based on an overarching government policy from the river to the sea to maintain the domination by Jewish Israelis over Palestinians, plus really serious abuses against Palestinians, you know, in the occupied territory. But when it comes to businesses, right, the obligations go beyond not being complicit in the center enterprise, settlement enterprise. There's an obligation upon, upon all actors to ensure non-complicity in these crimes, right? So businesses should, as the report recommends, and again, this is a very baseline uh, you know, recommendation. It's a floor, not a ceiling, should assess all of their activities between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean should mitigate human rights impacts and should end activities that make them complicit in these crimes. So that is significant because just avoiding settlements isn't enough. There's a need for a holistic review and action to end complicity in crimes against humanity. And of course, if you look at other uh, legal documents, for example, if you look at the Truth and Reconciliation Committee in South Africa, they had a much mo more thorough set of um, recommendations for businesses that could be a guide for businesses that want to go beyond the baseline and really ensure um, that they meet their standards. Let me stop there and looking forward to hearing from the other panelists. Thank you so much, Omar. And I think, you know, at the core of our coalition, as you say, is is to really show that there is complicity and that uh, I think a lot of the times, you know, uh, people observe and they see and they're like, oh, this is bad and settlements are bad. Uh, but in fact, there is very much things that European institutions, European companies, European investors uh, and, and uh, public institutions can do to, to, to really stop that or, or stop aiding and facilitating the, the settlement enterprise. So thank you. Thank you so much. And, and now, I will give the floor to Mr. Shukair. Um, you know, often again, you know, we're here, we're we're uh, we're giving figures, we're giving facts. Uh, this is about political decisions, uh, corporate decisions, but we have to uh, to really, I think, always remember. And I think Omar, you touched upon that that this is impacting millions of Palestinians every day. Uh, you know, yesterday only there was another wave of settler violence in the South Ebron Hill. Uh, people are injured, people are, are killed uh, by the occupation forces or injured by settlers. Uh, they can't access their agricultural land. So I think we always need to remember that there is a human impact. And so we want to hear now from Mr. Shukheir, who is a former mayor of uh, the village of Ezzawiye. Um, and Mr. Shukheir, so just to remember, just also to, to tell our, our uh, audience here that doesn't really uh, know Palestine that well, Ezzawiyeh is close to uh, the Salfit governorate. Uh, it's in the Salfit governorate. It's north of Ramallah and south of Nablus. It's also close to the Green Line and the Wall. So it's a village that is unfortunately surrounded by a lot of settlements and is a uh, frontline, um, you know, um, uh, impacted by settlements. So Mr. Shukair, I want to ask you, um, you know, what do Palestinians uh, living nearby settlement expect from companies and banks and, and all the financial institutions uh, involved with uh, the settlements? مساء الخير لكم جميعا شكرا لكم لإتاحة هذه الفرصة لي للحديث بلسان الأهالي والمواطنين الفلسطينيين. بشكل عام ومنطقة الزاوية بشكل خاص لما تعانيه بسبب الاستيطان الإسرائيلي لأراضينا 
في البداية بلت الزاوية كما عرفتي هي أحد قرى محافظة سلفيت تبعد حوالي 15 كيلومتر عن مدينة يافا الفلسطينية على الشاطئ الفلسطيني بلد الزاوية وأهل الزاوية يعانون أكثر من شكل بسبب الاحتلال الإسرائيلي بسبب الاستيطان هذا الاستيطان الذي تربى على أراضينا وعلى طرقنا وعلى كافة مناحي الحياة الفلسطينية تأثيره على المياه وعلى الزراعة وعلى الاقتصاد بشكل عام وعلى الحياة الاجتماعية ووقع الكثير من الضحايا بسبب مخلفات الجيش الإسرائيلي في المناطق الزراعية المختلفة الموجودة في أراضينا مسؤولية المولين هي مسؤولية أخلاقية ومسؤولية قانونية تجاه نشاطهم في الأراضي الفلسطينية حسب القانون الدولي هي يحظر أو يمنع استغلال الموارد الطبيعية أو المساهمة في تشجيع الاستيطان للأراضي المحتلة حسب القانون الدولي وهذه جريمة إذا كان الاستيطان جريمة فنحن في نظرنا كفلسطينيين فإن التعامل مع الاستيطان هو جريمة أكبر إذا المؤسسات الدولية التي تتعامل مع الاستيطان وتمارس نشاطات اقتصادية وتمويلية في نظرنا هي ترتكب جريمة أكبر من الاحتلال لأنها هي سبب في إطالة عمر هذا الاستيطان الاستيطان الأخير في العالم بالنسبة لنا كفلسطينيين توقعاتنا أن يكون هناك يعني حس أخلاقي وإنساني عند هاي المؤسسات وإذا كانت هي تجرد نفسها من هذا القانون أو من هذا الالتزام الأخلاقي فننتظر من شعوب والمواطنين والمؤسسات الإنسانية في مناطق ودول هذه المؤسسات أن يكون لها كلمة إنسانية لأنه هذه الشعوب كلها عانت على مدار العصور وعلى مدار التاريخ من اضطهادات ومن انتهاكات من شعوب أخرى ومن جيوش أخرى لذلك إحنا الفلسطينيين الشعب الأخير في هذا الكوكب الذي يعاني من هذا الاستيطان فتوقعاتنا أن يكون هناك كلمة حسم لإنهاء هذه الجريمة الإنسانية الأخيرة على مستوى العالم في انتهاك أموالنا وانتهاك أراضينا وانتهاك بلداتنا لذلك إحنا متوقع أن يكون هناك حراك قوي جدا لإنهاء هذا الملف لأنه يمس الإنسانية ويمس مصداقية هذه الشركات العالمية التي تدعم الاستيطان الذي يعتلي الجبال والتلال ويلوث الوديان يعني الاحتلال الإسرائيلي في استيطانه المقام على أعالي الجبال والتلال يسكنها ويلوث الوديان ولذلك يستمر ويتفنن ويبدع في مضايقة حياة الفلسطينيين التي أصبحت يعني في غاية الصعوبة بسبب هذا الاستيطان وبالإضافة إلى الشوارع والأسلاك الشائكة والجدران التي منعتنا من الوصول لأراضينا اللي جعلت من حياة الفلسطينيين باستمرار تعاني من الفقر والاحتياج لاستغلال الموارد الطبيعية لذلك إحنا نتوقع أن يكون هناك كلمة حسم لهذه المؤسسات التي تشارك في اضطهادنا وقتل مستقبل أولادنا وهذا ما يؤثر على السلم العالمي والأمان العالمي في عدم وجود مبررات لجهات أو لأشخاص على مستوى العالم لردات فعل لمواجهة هذا الظلم وهذه الشركات هي تتحمل جزء كبير من مسؤولية التوتر العالمي في دعم هذا الظلم وهذا الاستيطان الذي يعني يصادر كل مقومات الشعب الفلسطيني ليلا نهار لذلك إحنا متوقع أن يكون هناك وقفي وهناك وضع تاريخ زمني لإنهاء ملف التمويل الخارجي والتعامل مع الاستيطان الذي هو يعني يشكل جريمة عالمية بحق شعبنا الفلسطيني الحل النهائي هو إنهاء آخر استيطان في هذا الكوكب اللي تنتهي مشاكل أو معظم مشاكل العالم إحنا كفلسطينيين من حقنا أنه نعيش على أرضنا واستغلالها واستثمارها ألاف الدلمات حرمنا من الوصول إلها وأراضينا وكانت مزروعة بالقمح وكانت مزروعة بالبيارات وكان الأهالي يستغلونها بشكل يومي وبشكل دائم 
هذه الحركات الاستيطانيه حرمتنا وبالتحديد وجود القصاره او المقالع الحجاره اللي موجود في غرب بلد الزاويه اللي كمان اثر على حياتنا بشكل كبير جدا من استغلال للثروات الطبيعيه وتدمير المنطقه من ناحيه الزراعه ومن ناحيه بيئيه من تلوث وفقدنا الاف الاشجار بسبب ممارسات الاحتلال في هاي المنطقة واللي كمان حرم الأهالي من أن يقدروا يستغلوا هاي الأراضي في الزراعة كما كانت سابقا تزدهر وتشكل مصدر دخل أساسي ورئيسي لأهالي وسكان هذه المنطقة يعني بلدة الزاوي بالإضافة إلى وجود المحجر والكسار اللي هو سيطر على المنطقة الغربية بشكل كبير ودمرها بشكل سيء جدا تعاني كمان من ما يسمى شارع عابر الصامرة اللي يحد بلدة الزاوية منطقة الشبالية واللي قطع جزء كبير من أراضيها بالإضافة إلى المستوطنات اللي تم إقامتها على الجبال وتم تلويث الوديان بسبب المياه العادمة اللي موجودة بسبب المستوطنات هذا بملخص وشكرا لكم على حسن الاستماع وبارك الله فيكم شكرا يعطيك العافية أستاذ شفير أكيد هذا يعني واضح التأثير على الحياة تبعتكم فـ I will switch now to Professor to Professor Michael Link Thank you so much for being with us Uh, you have also uh, kindly uh, written the foreword of our uh, coalition's reports that I encourage everyone to go and read. Um, so, Ms. Professor Link, you are the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the Palestinian Territory, uh, occupied since 1967. So today, um, I wanted to you know, ask you, what is the role of, of uh, corporate actors in civil society Um, in entering respect of human rights in, in Palestine, but also um, can you tell us a bit the importance of the UN database of business enterprises that are involved in the settlements? And, and what do you think are specific actions that European governments can take to support uh, corporate accountability in the OPT? Anise, thank you for those questions and thank you for the, uh, for the introduction. My grateful thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak on this panel and my compliments to the uh, coalition of NGOs who've authored this excellent uh, report. You know, the disfiguring human rights consequences of the settlements upon the Palestinians in East Jerusalem and the West Bank are pervasive. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights has determined that the human rights violations emanating from the settlements include land confiscation and alienation, settler violence, discriminatory planning laws, the appropriation of natural resources, home demolitions, forcible population transfer, labor exploitation, forced evictions and displacement, physical confinement, and the imposition of a two-tier system of unequal political, social, and economic rights based on ethnicity, which uh, Omar Shakir has rightly defined as, uh, as apartheid. Above all, the settlements serve the broader goal of the government of Israel of staking an impermissible so sovereignty claim over parts of the occupied territory while simultaneously denying Palestinian self-determination. Corporate and business activities by Israeli and international corporations contribute significantly to the economic viability of the Israeli settlement enterprise. It is private corporations who, through tenders issued by the Israeli gov government that administer the settlement enterprise, construct the settlements and build and maintain the roads and utility infrastructure that service them. Businesses operating in the settlements and the industrial parks, in particular manufacturing and service industries and wineries, provide jobs and commercial activity that economically sustain the settlements while paying taxes to settlement municipalities. Private security companies guard many of the settlements and these companies and high-tech businesses uh, sur uh, supply surveillance and identification equipment. Banks and financial institutions facilitate the financial and fiscal structure to provide residential mortgages 
and to lend capital to businesses operating in the settlements. Law firms offer legal services to the settlements, settlers and settlement businesses. Real estate firms contribute, uh, co coordinate the sale and purchase of residential and commercial properties in the settlements. Agriculture corporations grow a number of foodstuffs for domestic and, interna and international markets utilizing large scale farming and modern technology. Domestic and international tourism is a uh, emerging sector for the settlements along with hotels and uh, accommodation rentals. Retail store chains operate in the settlements. Transportation companies link the settlements to each other and to uh, communities within Israel. Extraction companies exploit the OPT's natural resources, including minerals and water. Without this extensive corporate involvement, the settlements, which are the engine of the occupation, would be the unsustainable economic burden for the government of Israel. These businesses, domestic and international, benefit greatly from the illegal confiscation by Israel of Palestinian land and natural resources, from the discriminatory two-tier system of rights, and from pal Palestinian impoverishment and the resulting employment, as Omar has mentioned, of low-cost Palestinian labor in the settlements. That is the inevitable consequence of the settlement enterprise. I take the view, special rapporteur, that any form of corporate involvement, whether Israeli or international, whether direct or indirect, whether uh, intentional or incidental with the Israeli settlements is wholly incompatible with human rights obligations, with the guiding principles, and with any purpose of definition of enhanced due diligence. I say this for three reasons. First, the Israeli settlements are a flagrant violation and a grave breach of the Fourth Geneva Convention and a presumptive war crime under the Rome Statute of 1998. These are among the most serious of contraventions under international human rights, humanitarian, and criminal law. Second, corporations and businesses operating in or benefiting from the settlements provide the indispensable economic oxygen for their growth. Whatever positive benefits are cited by companies in defending their engagement with the settlements, often the employment of Palestinian labor or the payment of local taxes are far outweighed on the human rights ledger by the scale of gross violations inherent in the settlement enterprise. And third, the settlements are the primary political instrument, the pervasive facts on the ground employed by the government of Israel to advance its de facto and de jure annexation claims and to deny Palestinian self-determination. Annexation is a crime of aggression and self-determination is the first among equals of human rights. In February 2020, the uh, human, human Rights Council released the database of business enterprises involved in certain uh, activities related to the Israeli settlements. This database of business activities have been previously commissioned by the United Nations with respect to other conflict zones, including the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Myanmar. I welcomed the release of the database as it provides an important spotlight on corporate activity both Israeli and international, in the settlements, and it advances public and corporate understanding of the adverse human rights environment sustained by the settlements. But at the same time, I recognize that the database has a restrictive mandate. It did not seek to cover all business, business activity in the settlements that may raise human rights concerns. It was narrowly interpreted, i.e. a number of companies with important supply relationships with the settlements and the occupation were not included, and it did not contain an adjudicative mechanism. These concerns must be addressed while enhancing the database's uh, ability to be a living tool. Accordingly, and I say this in conclusion, it's my view that um, being able to follow the recommendations um, of this report would provide clear guidance to the international corporate community. I think if you follow the, the recommendations in the report, this would provide the clear and consistent human rights advice that corporations and risk investment consulting companies are looking for. It would bring the international business community's position on business and human rights in the occupied Palestinian territory in line with current thinking on international law and the settlements. 
It would bring the international business community's position in line with the evolving human rights thinking on the, on the pervasive scale of abuses in the occupied Palestinian territory, and would also heighten the international awareness that the Israeli settlements are human rights no-go zone. There should be no doubt in the mind of the international community and in the corporate and investment world that the settlements are not only a flagrant violation of international law, which is the terminology from the UN Security Council, but they also constitute a war crime, which is among the most serious of, human, of international crimes. Accordingly, the stance of the international community must be firm opposition to every aspect of the settlements and to oppose any policies and practices which further their development, including through corporate involvement. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Professor Link. I think you reminded something important as well about uh, the fact that this is not only about uh, Palestine. I think uh, uh, often the bad face arguments of, of Israel is to say that they're either you know, pointed out at the UN, singled out, uh, but in fact, is, is, uh, Israel is benefiting of, of high impunity, where in other contexts, you know, uh, corporations, businesses are held accountable. Uh, you reminded the, the example of Congo, but there's also a lot of scrutiny in Myanmar. Um, and, you know, more recently in the Uyghur territory uh, with forced labor. Uh, so I think it's important to understand this is really a human rights issue. It's an international law issue. And we're looking as a coalition to the legitimate, uh, you know, Palestinian quest for their rights. Uh, but this is, you know, what we're asking is not double standards. It's actually, uh, you know, the same standards and ending impunity and ending the complicity of, of the actors that are uh, directly contributing to any human rights violations uh, worldwide. Uh, so uh, now I will pass to uh, Mrs. Kiran Aziz. Uh, you are the senior um, responsible investment uh, analyst for, uh, and I'm sorry because I will mispronounce this, uh, the communal lens, you, I will let you <laughs> pronounce this, the KLP, which is uh, uh, one of the uh, big uh, Norwegian uh, investment fund. Um, so you can tell us a bit about what you do. Um, so we have obviously talked a lot about the bad students uh, and, uh, you know, what uh, companies can do. And in fact, here is a positive example of an organization uh, that has decided to disinvest from 16 companies that are uh, involved with uh, in occupied territory. So can you explain a bit to us the process? How did you come about with this decision? And how can this inspire similar actions from uh, other financial institutions? Thank you very much. And thank you for, for the invitation. I think the short version of KLP is sufficient because the, the long version isn't necessary. Um, and notices for conducting the report. I haven't read in details, but I look forward to, to read the report and see you know, what kind, kind of findings we can use uh, in follow, following up the companies going forward. I think it will be it will be good to use a couple of my minutes on explaining who KLP is and how we work with responsible investments, because then it will give you an overview uh, of how we proceed in this particular case. And you know, my co-panelists, both Maha and Omar, and at least uh, Professor Link, have given a quite good overview of the obligations which are to to businesses and not at least the international standards. So I will much more focus on how we actually work on, on these cases. So KLP is Norway's largest um, pension fund and we are mainly owned by the municipalities and the state healthcare entities. Um, and, and we have a long-term perspective on the investments uh, we have where we believe that the underlying economic activity must be responsible and sustainable. Uh, and we are mostly passively invested, so we have about 10,000 investments in over 70, uh, 70 countries, which means that we are exposed to a lot of risk, but at the same time, we would say that we have an opportunity also to make sure that we can influence the companies uh, to be more uh, responsible. Um, and in addition to that, uh, KLP has been working with responsible investments for more than uh, 20 years and the owners we have, they have quite high expectations in terms of where the pension money is um, 
is invested. And this is mainly why we have been working on responsible investments. And we have ethical guidelines, which are based on the international standards, such as human rights, uh, UN guiding principles, business and human rights, which have been mentioned a couple of times, and not at least the OECD sector guide for institutional uh, investor. And, and, and this document, it provides a quite common understanding, I would say, of the responsibilities of institutional investors. And what, what is the core in that, uh, in that guidance is that the investor should do due diligence assessments in relation to, uh, in relation to, their, to their business and not at least um, the investments they have. Um, and, uh, and the way we work, we have basically three tools. The first one is that we engage with the companies on the risk we might find uh, the company is exposed to. It could be related to human rights, it could be related to climate or any governance uh, issue. Um, and I would say this is the most important tool because we would like to, you know, we would like to be invested in the companies, but we, we want to make sure that the companies have a quite responsible approach to uh, to their business and they they are aware of the risk they have and how they're mitigating uh, the risks. And our expectations are to the board and to the management in each company. Uh, and it's important that the board is aware of the, of the risk uh, a company and can be uh, attached to. Um, and the other thing is that we, uh, we have the aim to, um, to vote on all general assemblies and it's mainly because the general assembly is the most important body uh, in the company and the third one is that we from time to time we exclude companies when we feel when we assess that there the company has an unacceptable risk uh, which could potentially like in this case contribute to violations of human rights uh, and, you know, in this case, how we assess that it was a risk for human rights in war and conflict situation. Um, and I have to say that we have, when it comes to the occupied territory of Palestine, we have been working with this for many years. So I will more, I will give, you know, late, uh, a little bit of insight about the latest exclusions. Uh, but in, in historically, we have, you mentioned Maha Heidelberg, which we have uh, excluded. And you know the way we work that we rely on information which is publicly available. Um, it could be information the company gives us through dialogue, but also reports which come from UN. And then this uh, database came from the UN, which was quite thorough work. Then it's an, it's a quite I would say you know a basic and quite a responsibility for, for, for investors to make sure to see if they could be exposed for any risk. And it was a quite good conducted work, you know, which gave a quite list of, of the companies which were, which were having um, business activity uh, uh, related to Israeli settlements. And the way we proceeded that we then we scanned all the list and we, um, we reviewed that we were invested in uh, 28 companies and it was total 112 companies on the list. And, and like in all the cases, we reach out to the companies in order to understand that they understand, you know, the risk they have been exposed to um, and will they be continue to have business activity uh, in, in the occupied territory and related to the settlements. Um, and, you know, we said several reminders, most of the companies are uh, based in Israel, as you as you know, and um, it wasn't much response we received uh, from the companies. But we did at least what we could in order to engage, because you know the companies has to respond respond in order for us to have have a dialogue a dialogue at all. And you know after some months when they didn't respond, then it was of course quite natural for us to look into that could this be a case for um, for exclusion. And, and in addition to that, we have a new, um, you can say, uh, you know, we have a new point in our uh, KLP's uh, guidelines for ethical uh, ethical guidelines, which it says it's about due diligence assessments. And what it says that KLP shall, you know, conduct due diligence uh, in the investments, and it can decide due diligence based divestments from the company if there is an 
a risk for companies being complicit in human rights abuses based on the combination of country, sector and company risks. Because normally we only look, uh, look, uh, look into uh, relations related to company, but if, if there is a risk on the sector they're operating in and the country, and then a combination of these can lead to, uh, can lead to exclusion. Um, and what we did that, you know, when we started to assess the companies, we, uh, we, we considered that if the companies linked to or operations in the West Bank could constitute um, an unacceptable risk of violating CELPIS guidelines, including contributing to human rights abuses and serious violation of the rights of the individual in situation of war and conflict, uh, that would be the core assessment. And as you all know that uh, there is, uh, the, both the Norwegian uh, government has been quite clear on the status of the Israeli settlements. And we know that the situation is in West Bank has worsened in uh, the past uh, year, and that there is a quite future risk for that it will continue. And you know, for us, it, it's important that we are, uh, as uh, Professor Link mentioned, that you know the companies they are and the investors should be consistent. So what we look into a concrete is the link between the company's business activities and the norm violations. So either the company should have actively contributed to the uh, violations or known about them but failed to take the necessary steps to avoid uh, contributing uh, to, uh, to that. And uh, with this regard, you know, we, we said, okay, well, how can we make a difference between could it be financial company will they be covered you know as you mentioned bnp paris it wasn't on the list so of course we haven't assessed that but we will given the recent report you have come with but the question we asked was that can the settlements be maintained without the services goods uh, which the company uh, supplies and if the answer to this question was no the recommendation uh, would be to exclude uh, the company, since these companies uh, supply necessary items of infra infrastructure uh, to the settlements. And when the activities are essential for to maintain the settlements, they will also constitute the strongest link between the company's activities and the human rights abuse in being, uh, being committed. Uh, and then we look into some, so we have, uh, what we did that we excluded, based on this, we excluded 16 companies, and it is within sectors such as banks, uh, you know, uh, constructions, uh, engineering services, the telecom sector, and apart from these categories, we took also individual assessments of four companies within, who pro which provide energy um, communication and surveillance uh, services. So we did a quite, you know, individual assessment and we came to that, you know, 16 companies uh, should be subject for, for exclusion. And one of the companies wasn't, which we also recommend to exclude, but wasn't, uh, you know, throughout the process, it wasn't uh, listed anymore. So then it wasn't uh, any reason for, for us to exclude the companies. Uh, so it was 16 uh, assessment, you know, exclusions from our side, but we have, what we also do is that the Norwegian, not just bank, the Norwegian Servant Fund, if they exclude company, uh, given that, you know, it's owned by the Norwegian people, then we will also follow their exclusions. And throughout the year, they excluded two companies, which we followed. So, so to summarize, we have excluded 19 companies. And then you ask about, you know, what can, um, and I think what is important for us that when a lot of the investors, you know, they exclude companies, but what we would like to do that in addition to, you know, try to influence the company, we want other investors to follow the exclusions we have. And this is the reason for why we, um, we published the exclusion document, which is quite thorough document, you know, why we be assessed it is to be uh, to be a breach with the ethical guidelines and this is more to show you know where we draw the line for what is acceptable and unacceptable but not at least to help other investors to identify uh, similar risk um, and it has been received quite well but of course a lot of people think that you know we, this is a political uh, case but for us what is important is you know the framework we have 
which relies on um, uh, international uh, law. So I think I will leave with that and then I can probably take some questions uh, if you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Aziz. And uh, now we'll go to the Q&A and maybe I can um, start with you because the last question was really directly to you and, and quite specific about what kind of data tool do you use to monitor uh, the reaches of the different norms, uh, if you you know if you have any tool, uh, monitoring tool, and, and how do you how do you measure that? Yes, you know first of all, like I said, we rely on the publicly um, available information. So when when there is a report uh, from the UN, or if, if there is a report conducted by any NGO, uh, which could be reliable, but we also buy data from data providers. Uh, we use uh, MSCI index, so we have we've been using MSCI, uh, which gives a quite thorough assessments of the companies on all the ESG aspect. And in addition to that, we also um, have another service provider, which is Refrisk, and it is more um, media monitoring. Um, so it, it's a good combination of a lot of, a lot of sources, and that's the reason for you know we for that we would like to engage with the NGOs because we know that one thing is what the company uh, will say, but we also are dependent on the information from independent sources. So it's it's a combination, I would say. Thank you, thank you so much. So uh, there's quite a few uh, questions. Um, there is a couple of questions around the European Citizen Initiative and the Occupied Territories Bill in Ireland. I think we'll address that in the end because the report focuses more on the you know, responsibilities of, of companies and private actors, but we'll definitely answer those questions. Um, there was some questions about uh, the role of tourism. Uh, and so maybe I give this question to Omar because I know you've researched the topic as well. Uh, you know, what's the, 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 the role of tourism companies um, in, the, in the settlement enterprise and, and how can we, you know, how can tourists and, and support, you know, or citizens, um, you know, hold accountable or, or do sustainable tourism, I guess, in Palestine? Uh, what are your recommendations on that particular um, sector? Happy to take the first part of that question. I might defer the second part, uh, maybe to Maha or others that might have more guidance on that front. But in terms of tourism, yes, we put out a report in 2018 looking at uh, the role of companies like Booking.com, Airbnb, and others in terms of um, applying the same framework uh, we laid out earlier to their specific activities. And you know, not surprisingly, we found that by renting, um, you know, apartments or, or homes. Uh, you are you are in fact you know contributing to and benefiting from serious rights abuses. So not only did we explore how that operates in practice, right, the way in which by brokering rentals on land confiscated from Palestinians that they, by the way, can't even enter, even if they were to book, uh, you know, on Airbnb booking their own property, which they have the document to, they can't even enter, right. Um, you know, not to mention when you add in the other parts of the analysis, right, that, you know, those homes are, you know, then to get to those homes, you're operating on roads, uh, some cases that Palestinians can't drive on, or you're, you know, operating on, uh, you know, it's using water and electricity um, in a system in which Palestinians are being denied those, uh, you are also sort of helping to sustain the economy, you're also providing a legitimacy, right, to the settlement enterprise, right? You're sort of making folks feel like it's normal. You're contributing to, as Professor Link put it, the war crime that's taking place because you are, uh, you know, sort of going further with erasing the legal distinction between the occupied Palestinian territory and to Israel proper, right? So, um, uh, of course, Airbnb, the day before our report released, announced that they were going to stop uh, listings and settlements and then basically caved under pressure. They uh, uh, succumbed to lawsuits from numerous Israel advocacy groups and have retained those listings. Um, other companies booking Expedia, Travelocity, many of these other operators are doing the same thing. And of course, it goes beyond brokering the rentals, right? You have in many cases an entire economy, um, you know, of tourism that operates uh, irrespective of the Palestinians that live there. And you have many tourists, in some cases, who have no idea. I mean, there's even issues of labeling on these websites. They have no concept that they're actually, and, and by the way, you'll find 
in many tourist tourist sites in the occupied West Bank, they're being operated and run by Israeli ministries based in Tel Aviv. And that's something, again, that's not sort of properly properly uh, done. So this all makes these businesses uh, you know, complicit in the rights of use, and we would call on those businesses to cease those activities. But maybe I'll uh, defer the second part of your question, I don't know, um, to maybe Maha or others who might have more concrete uh, 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 sort of thoughts in terms of how folks can deal with that reality. Actually, um, that was me extrapolating that question, but it, it, it drives me to some of the questions that were asked about what people can do. And I will try and answer very briefly that question. So at the moment, we're just releasing the report, but uh, just on behalf of the coalition, just so you know, we'll uh, conduct public campaigns uh, later on this year uh, in November. So uh, what I encourage you all to do is to, and, and encourage around you is to sign up uh, through the website or follow one of the organizations work in uh, from the coalition that is in your country. And you will then be able to follow what are the different uh, campaigns and mobilization that we are organizing. At the moment, we are uh, already in contact with some of the financial institutions and companies as Maha mentioned, and we hope to engage with them first. And uh, then, um, you know, if, if need be, apply more public pressure. So. Uh, stay tuned for that, uh, because that's, that is something that we will do uh, in the very near future as the coalition. And which drives me also to this question, um, maybe Maha, you can try and answer about like, have we thought of bringing the, you know, the, the companies uh, to court? What are the, maybe the strategic litigation or litigation possibilities, uh, you know, on, on the company, on the companies against these companies, if any. Um, Maha, do you want to briefly answer that? And maybe I would. I wanted to give you maybe another of the questions, which is also a tricky question. Um, someone was asking about: Are there any alternative to the, you know, to the companies involved in settlements or to uh, Israeli businesses uh, or companies, you know, that have relations more with Palestinian uh, companies instead of of the settlements? to support instead, um, if you can try and answer that question, thanks. Thank you, Ines. And these are two very uh, important and valid questions. And uh, with regards to strategic litigations and bringing uh, businesses and companies to court, um, as William said at the very early beginning in introducing the coalition, the vision is that this is this, this coalition and this campaign and this work stays on for several years and there's a long-term vision. And in the long-term vision, that's definitely taken into, uh, into consideration. For the time being, I think uh, we're very uh, far from that. But that being said, whether it's, uh, members of the coalition or partners or supporters or allies of the coalition, are in their own capacity and individually as organizations and smaller groups, have been working on, on preparing case files, on preparing uh, uh, different materials and evidence uh, for the potential uh, uh, submission of these before courts, uh, criminal prosecutors, etc., at different national uh, jurisdictions of some of the companies that are listed in the report and maybe others. So that, that, that work is, is, uh, is already happening by uh, different uh, groups and by different organizations. Again, we would hope to see it uh, becoming um, in the long-term part of the coalition's work. And maybe like to draw on a good uh, precedent or example of uh, court cases uh, against companies that have been involved in the settlement enterprise and in the construction of the annexation wall in Palestine would be the 20, uh, 2010 uh, Rewell case, the, the Dutch company, which was uh, brought in the Netherlands by the Palestinian human rights organization al haq You can find more details about this case on their website, but I think it sets an important um, precedent as to why we would need uh, litigation in order to counter uh, the corporate related abuses. And the, 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 the means and um, avenues for accountability for corporate related violations in theory, they, there's several of them, whether at national, regional or international levels. But at the end of the day, we also must acknowledge that they these have been uh, unfortunately 
uh, have been largely politicized, especially when we're talking in the context of Palestine. And the other thing is that they do take a very long time in order to, uh, to get us to some sort of result if, if we get to that. And uh, just on this point as well about uh, litigation and uh, accountability and so on and prosecution, it is important uh, to note and to go back to the report's recommendation, today's report's uh, recommendations, because one of the recommendations strictly calls uh, or explicitly calls on, on European governments uh, to um, incorporate legislation to give effect to the principle of universal jurisdiction at a domestic level, so we are able to prosecute corporate related grave breaches and ensure accountability in, in, in um, these scenarios. And of course, uh, the report does not forget about the ongoing investigations and proceedings that are happening at the ICC level, which would be um, more concerned with the individual criminal liability rather with a company as an entity or a state as an entity. And uh, as part of the recommendations as well, uh, that, 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 that was incorporated. So we would really hope to see the inclusion of corporate actors and individuals that have been responsible or involved in war crimes and crimes against humanity within the context of Israel's settlement uh, enterprise and which falls within the jurisdiction of the court. And uh, with regards to uh, the second question, um, can you repeat that, Ines? Sorry. <laughs> Yes, the, um, if there are alternatives, like uh, if investors or, you know, um, or, or citizens or I guess consumers or investors have alternatives to support Palestinian companies uh, instead of, of, you know, uh, investing in Israeli related mm -hmm. companies or settlement related companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure that there are alternatives, but this coalition and this report did not touch on this in the research process. This could inspire an idea for a, a next uh, step or the next uh, research uh, uh, project as part of this coalition. But at the moment, I think it's hard to give a constructive uh, or a precise answer. But what I will say is that businesses are businesses and it's important to uh, apply the law regardless of their nationality. So invest in Palestine uh, should, should, should abide by the law as it is by international law, human rights standards, whether they're engaging with um, multinational corporations, Palestinian or Israeli businesses. But of course, it remains that businesses that are operating in the occupied territory under Israel's jurisdiction as an occupying power, they have even stricter and more um, more respond, like a, a higher uh, due diligence to meet and a more uh, a higher level of due diligence to to meet and that they should for, for that they should be very uh, cautious and aware thank you thank you maha i wanted to add maybe two examples uh related to to the, the first question uh you know the lafarge french company was just uh, condemned because of their involvement and their complicity in crimes against humanity in syria I think these kind of cases are important as precedent and can set precedents for other companies to be prosecuted. Uh, there's also a case currently being investigated in a French court against uh, a military manufacturer, Exilia, for uh, possible war crimes in Gaza and for their involvement. Uh, but this is an ongoing case that uh, will probably take long. And another instrument that is important and someone reminded it in the Q&A is the OECD uh, focal points. So uh, each country has an OECD focal point uh, that is supposed to uh, help investigate uh, human rights violations by their national companies. Uh, at the moment, uh, I know of one, which is uh, the UK government is investigating uh, JCB uh, for their involvement in the occupied territories. So this is a work done uh, by our friends from Lawyers for Palestinian Human Rights uh, again, we don't know the result, but this should encourage also other uh, national efforts to, you know, submit uh, complaints to the national focal points and, and, and therefore drive uh, investigation. Um, so um, other questions that we have um, is uh, maybe then, I don't know if Willem or Natalie, you're around, if you want to answer the one around the European Citizens Initiative. 
uh, and uh, the uh, Irish uh, OPT bill. Can I, in the meantime, just add one comment? Yes, please. Please yes. go ahead. Um, as, is, as I said, you know, we looked into, we reviewed the uh, UN database, and you know, uh, it stood in the report that it will most likely be updated on an um, basis, but it's still uncertain whether it will be or not. But I think if, uh, if, if you know, UN is able to update it on an annual basis, it would be a, quite an important tool for a lot of uh, investors given, um, yeah. Yeah, given that it's a strong, a strong evidence and risk uh, for the companies uh, which will be listed, listed there. Professor Ling, do you want to add something maybe on what, on what was said before? I do. I guess let me see if I can do this in, a, in an efficient fashion. I'm, you know, when it comes to governments, I think at the very minimum, what they should be doing is issuing <clears throat> strong uh, advisories to corporations under their jurisdiction. Um, to explain the legal uh, situation with respect to the settlements. And ideally, they'd be taking a page from, uh, from Irish examples. Uh, and let's hope Ireland does complete the passage of the Occupied Territories Bill, of passing legislation something similar to what has been debated in the Irish Parliament uh, that would ban products coming from civilian settlements uh, created by an occupier in occupied territories, not simply in the occupied Palestinian territory, but anywhere. With respect to companies, I just think that the best advice is that they have to leave or, di uh, or divest from, um, uh, from any operations that have a connection to the settlements. With respect to pension funds, I think they should be divesting and they should be explaining why uh, they are divesting. With respect to retail sailors, uh, sale, sales outlets um, in, in the rest of the world, they shouldn't be selling Israeli settlement products. And you know, often the, the most visible of these settlement products are Israeli settlement wines. Um, and these should be, uh, these should be banned uh, from being uh, exported and sold. And with respect to domestic courts, I've heard somebody raise the issue of universal jurisdiction. I think that's, uh, that's an interesting idea. I always, as a lawyer, just caution about how uh, involved it to, and how much money and how much resources are involved in trying to litigate these kinds of cases. I think there may be more efficient ways of doing that. But my, my end advice would be this, the days of a yellow light, traffic light uh, advisory, i.e. you can invest in the settlements if you are careful about conducting a human rights due diligence analysis, I think those days are over. I think we have to accept that we need a red light advisory, that it is impossible to be involved or to be financing uh, any involvement in the settlement economy and still be operating in a manner consistent with human rights. I think that is impossible. And I think that's one of the great benefits of, of the report that's being released today is that it shows so clearly it, uh, any investment, any uh, uh, financial involvement in the settlements is absolutely incompatible with governing human rights norms. Thank you. We only have four minutes left. So Natalie, if you want to give a brief and then I'll conclude with uh, Omar and, uh, and Mr. Shukhaid. Sure. <clears throat> Sorry. So um, considering the, um, the citizen initiative uh, that was uh, submitted to uh, Three years ago, I think, uh, by seven citizens from uh, from seven countries, uh, European countries, was just accepted by the EU Commission after uh, uh, a first refusal and then uh, um, an action uh, before the European Court of Justice. Uh, and now the EU Commission is accepting it. It, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, they accept the, the ask the request of this uh, EU citizen, uh, citizen initiative, but it, it means that they accept that it is in the competence of the Commission to, uh, to impose some, uh, some uh, red lines uh, to the trade and to, uh, to make the trade, uh, to, to put it in line with human rights uh, uh, obligations. And here uh, with uh, international law obligations, uh, even uh, humani uh, international humanitarian law obligations, so uh, the, the, the ban of settlement goods is an obligation uh, to, that the trade has to, to, um, to, to be submitted to, to, this, uh, to, this, to this obligation. And it must be done by the EU first, but 
as the EU is not acting, the EU member states have to, to pass also uh, laws to, to ban those settlement uh, goods uh, from their markets. And for sure, with the citizen uh, launching this citizen initiative, we will, uh, we will campaign for that. But uh, in the meanwhile, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that the governments cannot uh, avoid their obligation. It's an obli obligation of third states under uh, international law. Thank you, Natalie. And, and again, keep, keep, uh, keep tuned. And I think when I'll, I'll conclude by, by giving you all like uh, the different uh, ways to follow our campaign. Mr. Shukhev, uh, 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 شكراً لكم بالحقيقة إنه الأرقام التي استمعنا إليها هي أرقام مخيفة جداً عن المبالغ وحجم الاستثمارات التي تتم على أراضينا بخصوص البدائل التي تحدثتم عنها لهذه الشركات يعني لسان حال المواطن الذي تم سرقة أرضه وسرقة موارده هي ليست مسؤوليته أين تذهب هذه الشركات في الاستثمار هذه الشركات عندما قامت وأسست لم تكن تعتمد فقط على الأراضي المحتلة من أجل تحقيق أرباحها هذه الأرباح التي يتم تحقيقها هي على حساب المواطنين المساكين والمواطنين البسطاء في أراضيهم التي تم نهب أموالهم وأراضيهم وممتلكاتهم لذلك هذه الشركات هي فقط المسؤولة عن إيجاد بدائل لاستثماراتها وتحقيق أرباحها بالإضافة لما تحدثتم عنه بخصوص الاستثمار مع شركات فلسطينية لكن لسان حال المواطن هو يبحث عن أرضه وعن ممتلكاته وعن حقه في العيش بكرامة والاستفادة من ممتلكاته وأراضي بعيدا عن أي استغلال قد يتم كان من الاستيطان الإسرائيلي أو من شركات عالمية تحاول الاستثمار معها وشكرا شكرا جزيلا عمر Yeah, I'll just very quickly, I know we have a minute left. I think we're really at a turning point when it comes to recognition of what the reality on the ground is. Uh, 2021 has seen uh, numerous uh, international human rights groups and Israeli human rights groups endorse what Palestinian civil society has been saying for years about the reality of apartheid. That's been echoed by the former UN Secretary General. It's been echoed um, you know, by two former Israeli ambassadors to South Africa, by South Africa itself, Namibia, foreign ministers, of uh, France and Luxembourg, I could go on and on. Businesses need to realize this reality that they operate against. The job of a business is not to end the conflict or bring peace. Um, it's to do their work, um, but they must do so in a way that avoids complicity with crimes against humanity. The tide is turning. Uh, this report is a reminder that many businesses are on the wrong side of that. They need to get on the right side of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Omar. Thank you uh, a lot to all of our panelists today. Um, so uh, a big thank you, obviously, to our Belgian partners coordinating this coalition who has made this work happen, the 11-11-11. Um, and so basically, uh, I, again, I encourage you to stay tuned to uh, the developments in our coalition's work uh, by signing up either on our website in the Compact Us uh, tab or just to follow us on social media, uh, any of the organizations that are part of the coalition. And um, um, we also will put the recording of this event online on the website, as well as all the links and different uh, references that we have shared with you um, that you've uh, hope, hopefully found useful. Uh, thank you so much for being uh, you know, uh, numerous to be with us today. Um, and uh, yeah, onward, the work continues, definitely. Thank you.